Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm trying to cover all my bases because I don't know where you all, all are based. I'm in Barcelona, I'm in Spain, and it's now three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, just in case you can't remember what you signed up for, here is a, a brief description of the aim for today. And I'll be exploring um, what employability sc uh, skills are and why they're in hard, high demand today in the workplace. And I've um, set myself three objectives for this session, which I'm going to go through now. Um, so I'm going to be looking at um, uh, the definition for employability skills uh, uh, today, what, what it means. Um, I'm going to be looking at um, what happens in our business English classrooms and how our learners practice these skills can and do already practice these skills in our classrooms. And then I'm going to hopefully present some ideas of my own for how I think we can develop this further, um, this emphasis on um, employability skills in our classrooms. Uh, so to start with, uh, let's look at a definition of employability. Um, this definition is from um, a UK government uh, briefing paper. And as you can see, I've left some green blobs over some of the words. And I'm going to give you a moment just to read through and see if you can guess what the hidden words are. Okay, so here we go. So the set of basic generic skills as well as attitudinal and behavioral, behavioral um, that are believed to be essential, employment, progress, and workplace. Okay, so the thing is that, um, uh, excuse me. Yeah, so a couple of things here about this definition. What is very clear from it is that it refers to both pre-work students, people who are still studying to get into the workplace, and also it, it applies to people who are already in work because it's about how you get a job, but also how you sustain a job and how you, you have a successful career, how you make progress in your profession. So that, that definition covers both of those things. Uh, the other thing I want to say about that definition is the, the part I've underlined where it says are believed to be essential. Um, who are the key stakeholders here when we're talking about employability skills? And um, uh, the obvious answers are obviously the employers themselves who are looking for staff, government agencies, um, uh, education uh, institutions, uh, trainers, teachers like ourselves, of course. Um, and obviously, um, uh, employees and students who want to be sure that the skills and the training that they're receiving is relevant to the workplace and their needs. So that's one thought. So the other thing is about um, how um, I thought about simplifying this definition a little bit, because I think it could do with a little help to clarify a bit. Um, so again, just think for a moment how you could simplify that a little bit, and then I'll show you what I did. Okay, so this type of task of simplifying a, a more complex text is actually very useful to try as well with your advanced learners because it's a, it's a real challenge for them to try and put a complex um, uh, idea into simpler language. And it's also in itself a key employability skill. Um, moving on then about um, employability skills, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history here. Now, um, a recent UK study by um, educational researcher Tricia uh, Fettis and her team um, said this, that there has been a long history of identifying skills, qualities, attitudes, behaviours required to be successful in the workplace. And in fact, in, in this study, uh, they were, went back to the 1980s, in fact, where the Confederation of British Industry was already looking at um, the type of skills that they were looking for from, from employees. Um, so I think that's a very important thing uh, to, to bear in mind, that it's not something new. It does have a very long history. Something else that Trisha Fettis and her team point out is that there are various labels. Or over, historically, there has been lots of different labels for this, and there, is to, there are today as well. And again, you might already know and think of other ways that this has been expressed, this term employability skills. Um, 
So here are a few examples for you. And a few more examples. And finally, a few more examples. So you may be familiar with some or all of these, and you may even know of others. And uh, the um, another example that I came across uh, last year was this interesting one, where they talk about human skills. Another way of saying employability is talking about human skills. Now, this quotation is from the World Economic Forum's annual report on the future of work. Now, they talk about two types of skills that are needed nowadays. And there's the new skills at work that are driving demand for, sorry, new tasks at work that are driving demand for new skills. This is essentially talking about um, uh, digital literacies, computer skills, essentially, and the need to be technology, tech savvy. Uh, but at the same time, it's saying that it's still very important to have these human skills, and in fact, that they will even increase their value. What does the World Economic Forum mean by this? The type of human skills, the examples they give are people skills, interpersonal skills, creativity, and problem solving, the kind of things that it's difficult for computers to do. So um, just to bear that in mind, that that's the sort of thing we're talking about when we're talking about employability skills. Now, just to give a little background on the World Economic Forum. It's actually a private institution based in Geneva in Switzerland. And as I say, it produces an annual report on the future of work. And um, it's most famous for um, its annual meeting in Davos in Switzerland. And at this annual meeting, you will find world leaders go to it, um, uh, world business leaders go to it. It's a, it's a big event every January in Davos. Um, and the reason I mention it is because this expression, the 4IR, came out of the Davos meeting in 2016. What does 4IR stand for and what's the connection to employability skills? The following. So um, this professor um, introduced this term, the fourth industrial revolution. He is the uh, founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. And in 2016, he introduced, he presented his book and coined the term, the fourth industrial revolution. Now, what is the fourth industrial revolution and what is the relationship to employment skills? His point was that um, society is changing very, very rapidly. And whereas in the third industrial revolution, we have, we're familiar with um, computers and automation and a lot of the kind of jobs that are being done now by robots in factories, and car factories, for instance. And what we're, we're entering now is this fourth phase, the fourth industrial revolution with the 5.0 society, which is the combination of artificial in, in intelligence, machine learning, which moves on from the basic machines, static machines, putting things together, combined with the Internet of Things, uh, big data, etc., which means that there's, there's a huge change in society and the way we work. And therefore, we need to be prepared for it. This is why employability skills are more important than ever. So um, um, one of the issues is whether jobs at risk, and there's been a, a, a lot of um, emphasis on this about people losing their jobs due to automization. Now, I'm just going to give you a little anecdote here of um, something that happened when um, when I was growing up. Um, there was this job, um, and it was a milkman. And, uh, it was never a woman; it was always a man. And his job was essentially to deliver milk to your front door, and he did that. Um, in an electric um, vehicle called a milk float. And he came with crates of milk, and inside the crates were bottles, glass bottles of milk that he delivered to your doorstep, which you then used, washed, left out for him to take away, to be washed and reused. Now, obviously, as time went on, uh, people could buy uh, milk from cartons from the supermarket, and more recently, uh, from plastic containers from the supermarket. So, what that means is that basically the milkman's job all but disappeared. Now, the interesting thing about this is that um, uh, it's actually coming back into fashion in the UK for various reasons. People want their milk out of bottles, it's all sorts of things like that. So the whole issue, it's kind of, if you like, a, a funny example or a silly example, but to show that really it's the whole idea of jobs being at risk, it's uh, a lot more complex than it seems. Um, and that it's not simply a case of like um, jobs disappearing. 
it's very often a case of tasks changing. The way we work is changing very rapidly. And we all know that in our own teaching roles, how um, automation and technology has had a big impact in the way we do our jobs. And that's just one little example for you. Um, so to bring you on to the, the next point, which is well, what exactly are these skills? Um, and again, uh, Fetis's uh, um, report has a very nice quotation, I think, uh, that says, obviously, um, not only are there various labels for employability skills, but there is no one definitive list of these skills. And I think that's very important to bear in mind, because you will find employers, organizations, and professional bodies will keep bringing out lists, and you'll see lots of different lists. So for instance, um, LinkedIn, the professional networking website, has a list every year about the top soft skills that are needed. Um, the World Economic uh, Forum, which I mentioned earlier, has an annual report that comes up with a top 10 list. Um, so there's kind of a lot of lists out there. But what FETIS does point out is that there's certain generic skills that are always coming up, and that's communication, problem solving, team working are big ones, and also attributes such as resilience, enthusiasm, and creativity. So it's important to bear that in mind that, that there are lots of labels for the same thing, and there's no one definitive list, but there are certain commonalities in the list. And so um, just to finish off that, my first point there, there are some four issues that I want to raise. One is something called um, jangle fallacy, which is this idea that there are a lot, there are a lot of terms out there for the same thing. So be it um, key competencies, be it employability skills, be it soft skills, whatever. There are lots of ways of saying the same thing, and it kind of creates confusion, unfortunately. It creates unnecessary noise for us. The other thing is, there's a lot, um, uh, um, it's not very precise what's out there at the moment. So, what is a hard skill? What is a soft skill? Very difficult to define. Um, what's the difference between flexibility, adaptability? Uh, what exactly does critical thinking mean? There's a lot of questions to ask yourself when you start looking at these issues. And um, there isn't a lot of clear answers to these questions. Um, the third thing that is, is problematic is there's a lot of uh, conflation. So, you know, as, as um, in the, the quote, uh, quote earlier, you could see skills are mentioned on the one hand, like communication, but also things like attitudes, like enthusiasm. So they all get conflated together into a one set, one list. And the final really important point to remember, of course, is that skills are not developed in isolation. We're doing, we're practicing several skills at the same time. And I mean, let's think of an example where, you know, you've got your students or, or a work group are, are trying to deal with a problem together. They're doing all sorts of things at the same time. So you're going to have communication skills being put into practice, problem solving, creativity, critical thinking, um, all sorts of other things are happening, leadership perhaps, you know, so all of those things are happening, conflict resolution, all within the same task. So it's very difficult to try and teach those skills, I think, and, uh, um, and learn those skills in isolation because they're all going to be go happening together at the same time. So what are the top skills that seem to come up time and time again? Well, in this recent UK study, what they did was uh, a literature review of no fewer than 21 different recent studies that asked employers what they wanted. And then they kind of put together a frequency table to see, well, which were the highest ones, what came up on top every time. And these were the five in this order that came out on top. Um, and so I think that is a good starting point for us to be able to like focus our attention is to look at, well, what are the top five and what are the relevance to the language classroom? Now, the other good thing that this report does is it gives concrete workplace examples of each of those five skills to help us see what they mean. So let's look at the first one. I'm gonna go through each of these five skills and give you some workplace examples. Now, as you look at the workplace examples, I'd like you to think of maybe other workplace examples, and also to think about classroom, your own classroom examples, okay? Now here, it kind of struck me immediately that these two uh, examples of problem solving skills are something that we do frequently in our classes when we're doing um, uh, business case studies. Uh, you know, you give them a, a scenario, you give them a set of data, whether it be reports, graphics, etc., where the students have to look at it, analyze it, pick out the key information. 
then they would have to like prioritize the problems then they might have to come up with an action plan uh, present their uh, brainstorm ideas evaluate ideas present their ideas so that's a very clear example of of how we can recreate what happens in the workplace in the classroom in the business english classroom very easily second item now communication is obviously as if you're teaching the community of language classroom that is our number one priority and what's nice about this report is it kind of breaks it down for us into different categories subcategories of communication so things like what we do on a daily basis in terms of socializing in terms of small talk um, also things like telephone skills um, uh, writing obviously email the obvious one report writing uh, writing slides is another example and then obviously presentations a huge area of communication skills and again here's a, here's a look at just a couple of the examples that this report gives of a workplace example again a fundamental skill here is being able to explain complex ideas in very simple um, in very simple terms to have good communication skills um, obviously we often go through the mechanics of a presentation with our students what to do at the beginning what to do in the middle what to do at the end um, what's also um, interesting is the idea of how we adapt um, the presentation so it's appropriate for our audience um, so again you know these are things that we do quite often in the language class and we could be doing more of them but paying more attention to as well um, self-management basically it's broken down to two categories mostly time management prioritizing your work and things like appropriacy of behavior and, and dress um, two examples from the report again it's um, it's not something I, I teach mostly adults um, in company it's not something I'd spend a lot of time with them on um, when I've taught in, in universities obviously you might need to deal with issues of punctuality and organizing their workloads and things um, but it's certainly as a topic time management is a really interesting topic to talk about in the business English classroom uh, teamwork again massive really really important all the employers put that up there and, and in my own experience talking to employers they say it's really important as well and again it, it does fall into three very distinct subcategories as well which is worth bearing in mind so involvement is this as an example so how much you contribute to your team to meetings to projects etc is one very important thing what's interesting is the second one support how much do you actually help and support your colleagues um, really interesting um, category and then the third one is how much do you appreciate other styles and other approaches and other ways of working hugely important for the need for diverse teams and, and the fact that you will be working in lots of teams with people from lots of different departments and working in agile teams more and more nowadays and the fifth and final one creativity we talk a lot about in the language classroom as well um, and again the examples are quite interesting because it's not saying about you all um, coming up with with your own suggestions and ideas and strategies uh, but also being open being open to other ways of doing things I think that's really crucial as well when it comes to creativity and team working of course so those are some examples of workplace what you could get your students to think about of those from those five is their own examples of their own workplace examples if they are in work um, and, and obviously for students pre-work what you're doing in your language classroom that helps with these five areas as well particularly uh, one two four and five not so much uh, the third one for me I think at least um, so just to summarize there I think problem solving is a big thing that we do already and we could we could focus more on in the business English classroom a lot more work on communication skills teamwork and particularly working in international team and finally creativity so I'd like to for this um, uh, final part of my presentation is go into um, some teaching ideas and I put these into four groups um, and I'm going to look at each of these groups in turn. Um, so let's start with the first one of how we um, make people, uh, students more aware, what we want to make students more aware of. Um, and I've put this into four groups as well. So exactly what are employability skills, the same way as we've done in this webinar, start this webinar to talk about the skills. Um, also very importantly to uh, 
allow students to articulate their own skills that they have and their own skills that they want to develop so that they know for themselves, so that they know when they talk about to their, their current employers or when they talk to future employers what their skills are and they can demonstrate those skills. They can give concrete examples. Um, also very useful, interesting conversation is about how technology and particularly automation is affecting our students' companies, their sectors, their industries that they work in. And what I also like to do in the Business English Classroom is to look at any relative, uh, uh, re sorry, any relevant research to do with skills development, because I think that's part of the lifelong learning, ongoing, ongoing learning that we all need to be aware of and, and involved in. So let's take each of these uh, uh, one step at a time. Um, when I'm looking at employability skills in the classroom, I teach it very explicitly. And um, one of the ways I do this is to do a little bit, for example, a bit of reverse brainstorming. So I would ask this question. I'm going to show you a few of the answers, you know, across the levels. And um, these are some of the answers I get from students. So, I mean, this exercise is very interesting itself because you can see how uh, what the students' level of awareness, um, and, and also it brings out a lot of really interesting vocabulary as well, um, and, uh, and opinions and discussion. Um, another way of, of looking at um, uh, this issue, bring it, where, raising awareness, is of course is to talk to employers and see what employers say. You might do that by bringing an employer into the classroom to meet your students. I don't know if you have job fairs at the university or uh, the, head, the head of human resources in the company where you're teaching, could maybe ask them to come in and talk to the class. Um, another way of doing it is, is to, to, to find authentic videos where you've got employers um, are talking about um, em employability skills. And this is one very short example. I'm going to show you an extract to give you an example of what I mean. And as you watch this extract, I'd like you to think about um, how you would use this in the classroom. OK, I'm just going to swatch o switch over now to um, video. didn't happen. Hmm. My apologies there. Let's see if I can get this to work. Ah, here we go. A large part of the academic experience is based around individual performance. In business, however, things are quite different. You need to develop a range of transferable skills. And one thing that many recruiters put at the top of their list is the ability to work in teams. I would look at, can this candidate fit into the team well? Do they work well with people? Are they passionate about the topic? Do they think outside of the box? The employers value team working skills very highly indeed. So if you're studying, it's really important you try and get some experience. Now, obviously, an internship's an ideal way to do this, but you can also do it through part-time jobs, through vacation work, through voluntary work, or helping with societies and clubs while you're at university. Your experience at school is really, really important. So if you played in a team, guess what? You're a team player. You set goals. You can achieve. 21st century careers involve a lot of movement not just between jobs, but also between industries and countries. It's no good if your skill set locks you into one industry or even into one company. And this is where flexibility is important. Be prepared to develop attributes that are transferable across sectors so you can make the best moves for your career. I'm talking about things like critical thinking, which means analyzing information very carefully communication skills, problem solving, being able to influence people. Make sure you work on your communication skills in person, on paper, face to face, in small groups, in large groups. You need to do this wherever you work, whatever job it is, across all sectors. Communication skills are absolutely key. Employers are not just hiring a package of skills, they're hiring a person and it's personal qualities that are of key importance. Honesty, 
flexibility, enthusiasm. These things matter a lot. Be passionate. If you're really going to apply to a company that you're interested in, make sure your passion comes through and be genuine and authentic about that passion. You're going to work hard, you're going to play hard, but you have to be passionate to be successful. Okay, so let's go back to the video, to the presentation. Here. Okay, so um, so I think um, we're we're back at the uh, presentation slides here, and um, as you can see from that video, one of the things you can do with this is. Um, uh, have an initial discussion with your student about their own skills, then you can do uh, um, you can do some just comprehension work, you can do some detailed comprehension work, uh, then you can look at some really nice vocabulary from, from this video. This is just a small extract of a slightly longer video, but these things like thinking outside the box, can do attitude, set goals, critical thinking, some really nice expressions and really nice explanation of some of those, those expressions like critical thinking. Um, so you can extend on that vocabulary. And then importantly as well, you can get the students to do some kind of collaborative project where they're going to put that vocabulary into practice, where they're either talking about their own jobs and their own duties and skills that they have, or they could be talking about other jobs that they know. So I think that provides a nice lesson structure just based around that video where you're explicitly dealing with employability skills. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention was um, the impact of technology. And again, very similarly, you can um, uh, use videos or even written text about the student's um, um, industry or sector and look at that and discuss that as well. And it's, and it's a very engaging way to, to, to raise awareness um, and deal with issues. Now, this is another video. Um, again, it's just a one one minute video uh, looking at automation in the restaurant industry. And um, I'm going to switch over to this video and show you this. These lunchtime diners in San Francisco are intrigued by a fully automated restaurant that looks more like a computer store with touchscreen ordering and freshly made meals delivered in a box. Technology is allowing us to provide a product at an unprecedented speed. So the time-pressed consumer in the financial district really doesn't have the patience for the old ways of, of going out and buying food interacting with somebody who might not hear your order correctly. We've addressed that by creating a process that is incredibly fast, incredibly precise, and ultimately gives the customer much more control about what they want for lunch. I had to try it for myself. Much like any other touchscreen menu, it starts with the swipe of your credit card. You can customize the menu. The food here is all vegetarian. Once your order is placed, it's prepared at lightning speed by chefs working behind the scenes. So here it is. That was less than two minutes. The food has been delivered. It says here, tap twice. <laughs> the door opens. And here's lunch with my name on it. My balsamic beet salad. Looks good. Usually we only have half an hour, 45 minutes for lunch, so it's nice to be able to come out during actual lunch hour and get a quick healthy lunch. This is the first time I've seen anything this automated and this high quality coming out of a machine. I've seen, you know, they have similar things in Amsterdam, but the quality of the food isn't half as good. I think that we're moving away from social interaction and this is just completely facilitating that. We didn't have to talk to anyone to get our to get a, a food made for us, which I don't necessarily think it's the best thing, but it's certainly, um, I think, the direction where we're all going. Okay, so 
I, again, you can see from that video how you could uh, structure a lesson around that by in the, the kind of engaging the students at the beginning, uh, talking about their own attitudes to lunch breaks, um, doing a gist um, comprehension task, uh, a detailed comprehension task, and then pulling out all that nice vocabulary, uh, uh, automation, customized, etc. Um, and what's really interesting as well, of course, is the pros and cons of automation in, in the industry where we heard some of the speakers there talking about that and students can, can respond to that as well. And then do some kind of project where they're looking at ways of automating um, a, a service or something that they know well. Now, I've done uh, similar things with leaders like this to um, in the hotel industry because uh, when I've taught in um, tourism students, um, I've uh, found videos and, and reading materials about two um, futuristic automated um, hotel chains. Uh, one is the Hana hotel chain in Japan. The other one is the Fly Zoo hotel chain in, in China. Um, and I, I, first of all, it kind of quite surprised me that students weren't aware of this level of automation in their industry. Uh, and when we do do it in class, it really gets them sitting up because some students will go, oh, oh my God, you're telling me that uh, I've been studying um, for a degree for four years and 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 it's, it's useless and then other students will go well well no hold on a, a computer can't do this you can't automate that um and so this is really interesting that, that, that they're they you know they're on fire when they're thinking about this kind of stuff because they're they're aware that um automation is going to take away a lot of their tasks and therefore they they have to know what their skills are what their human skills are and where their future lies in in the hotel and tourism industry and the other interesting thing about that is, of course, that students also bring up all sorts of other issues, um, um, other challenges for the industry, such as things like inclusion, you know, el elderly people and their access to services. Everything is automated, for instance. They also talk about environmental issues, ethical issues about uh, uh, jobs and things. There's a whole lot of other issues that are, that are, that are really interesting to explore with students. Um, so, sorry, let's move on here. No, they seem to be stuck. Oh, no, here we are. To continue then, the third thing I wanted to talk about was relevant research into skills development. This is what I call food for thought. Um, and let me give you some examples. Um, in particular, Professor Carol Dweck's work on mindsets and fixed mindsets and growth mindsets. And there is no doubt that if we're going to have to be adaptable in our careers and flexible in the way we work because of automation, because of the changes in society, then we're going to need to have a growth mindset and our attitudes to things like challenges and setbacks, et cetera, um, are, are, are going to have to be in that growth mindset way. So introducing students to this concept, um, uh, I find it really powerful for them and really useful. Um, and she has also done a couple of videos as well that you might be interested in exploring yourself or even showing some of it with your students. Um, there's a short um, TED talk, about 11 minutes, and she's also done a, over an hour with uh, Google lectures, I think. So those are, I'd recommend looking at those if you haven't already. Um, other types of research that I've shown my students has been to do with communication skills, and particularly um, this overuse of uh, written communication, because I think it's efficient and it's fast, but it isn't always the best choice of uh, communication. And if you can show students research like this from Cornell University, um, Cornell University, sorry, where face-to-face -face contact, picking up the phone is often much better, um, then students are aware that they may not, by just dashing out emails, they may not be choosing uh, the best mode of influencing people when they need to communicate. And I think that's a really valuable lesson. Um, recreating aspects of um, of the workplace in the classroom, obviously, it's something we all, would all like to feel that we're doing. Uh, but as one teacher said to me last week, it's difficult to do, and I agree, it is difficult to do. And the things that we'd like to do in the classroom, um, three things I think that we want to do, is obviously show students why certain skills are important in the workplace. Um, we want them to be able to notice different communication styles in the workplace. And we also want to be able to give them the kind of functional language that they need. Um, so again, uh, one other very valuable way of doing this, I find, is through dramatized video this time, not authentic video, but actually dramatized video, um, particularly where students can see international teams working together 
and 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 how the kind of issues that come up when working in international teams and the kind of skills that are needed to work in international teams. And again, I'm going to show you a very um, brief clip of a dramatized video um, of one of the typical issues, one of the typical problems of, of um, team working. Okay, I'm just going to swap over to the video again. Right then, thanks everyone. We'll all meet again at the same time next week. Bye bye. Thank you. I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. About what? What, Dan? He's just so arrogant. Quality, quality, quality. I'm not sure that I can work with him. Look, this is the first time you've talked. I'm sure you'll find a way. Why don't you just try? Could you manage the US IT side of things? I'd prefer to work with Paola and the Mexico rollout. I really like Paola. Well, hang on. Let's take some time to think about this. So, um, again, this is a typical situation where, um, you know, teams can be homogenous or teams can be diverse. And um, there are pros and cons of both of those things. And it's a really nice way to show students that, um, you know, what the issues are and what the pros and cons are. So with a homogenous team, obviously, you're going to have a lot of harmony. Um, people are going to get on well. That's very positive. On the downside, maybe um, disagreements going to be suppressed in the for the sake of harmony, and maybe the, the kind of ideas, um, problem solving ideas are going to be quite limited because everyone thinks in the same way. Diverse teams, you're going to get the issue where um, uh, there possibly is a potential for more conflict, but at the same time, uh, there's also the potential um, for uh, a greater variety of approaches and ways of solving things and more creative ideas. And as one of my students said to me this week, she said, you know, like, I, I learn more from a diverse team, and I think that's a really interesting point as well that she made. That that you know we can, we can work in in homogenous teams, but it's not necessarily a, a good thing. It, there's pros and cons of both, and I, I think um, to be able to point that out to students, particularly our pre-work students. I don't know if you have the same situation that I've come across, but they like to work with their friends when they're in university groups, and it would re really and I kind of mix them up because that's what you do in the communities of language classroom but if they can actually see the value of it when they go into the workplace I think then that's going to give them more motivation to work in diverse teams as well and more experience working in diverse teams so um, the third point I want to make was about um, what I call aha moments which is when students uh, have to think uh, not just learn by doing but also uh, learn by thinking. And here's a reflection from uh, uh, um, um, Harvard University team, where they, they say there's actually two types of learning, the learning by doing and also the learning by thinking. If you put those together, that's a very powerful combination. And I don't know um, if I up to now have spent enough time doing the learning by thinking where you say to students, okay, well, what lessons did you take away from today's class? How would you apply that in the real world, for instance, that type of thinking? What well, a third element to this is actually sharing with other people what your thought processes are about what you've learned. So there's actually three stages. One, doing something, for example, let me give you an example where you've got a group of students to work together as a team then getting to think about how effective they worked as a team, what went well, what went badly, what they would do differently next time, and then share their thoughts with, with each other so that there's a deeper learning from that. So that's what I mean by encouraging reflection and aha moments, because students do come away from that with having learned something. And that's the reference there from the Harvard Business School. And the final point that I want to make is to do with our assessment systems. Now I'm going to go back to a quote from the very first video I showed you about transferable skills, and this is what the presenter said. So this is true, I think, that we do 
um, reward and recognize people for their original performance in their in their exams and the, the coursework, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, in the real world, what recruiters want, what companies want is the ability to work in teams. So my reflection on this was, well, to what extent in our uh, classrooms, in our assessment systems, do we reward uh, good teamwork, do we reward involvement, do we reward support of each other, and do we reward uh, collaboration? Um, I, I asked this question last week in a, a group of, of teachers in Milan, and, and a couple of teachers said, actually, yeah, we, we uh, give students uh, points and uh, marks for team presentations. So I thought that was a very good example. And I think that, you know, if we want to reflect the world of work in the classroom, then we obviously need to reflect that in teaching and learning and in our assessment systems as well. So to finish here, um, I'd just like to kind of schematically show you what I think um, is what's happening in our language classrooms. We're doing um, obviously a lot of, uh, of um, the four skills, listening, reading, writing, speaking. We do um, grammar, we do vocabulary. We do all, all the business skills in terms of already, in terms of uh, presentations, meetings, email, etc. to the functional language from that. And also cultural awareness is, has been a big feature of business English re um, in, in recent years, in recent decades. Um, and I think that employability skills will take, um, will become more core to our business English classrooms for the reasons that I've tried to set out today in the webinar. So um, that is all from me. 